afternoon, everybody. Sorry, thanks. Uh, apologies for a little bit late start. Um, we had uh, just we had 50 people registered for today, but there is an interruption in the Lewis today and, and etc. So it's a more intimate crowd, and all the better for that, uh, I'm sure. So you're all very welcome to the Institute of International European Affairs. We're very honoured to be joined by Julie Brill today, uh, the day after the Data Summit. And uh, Julie has spoken here before, in fact, uh, at McCann Fitzgerald's offices in uh, July of 2016, mm -hmm. an event co-hosted with the Institute, which happened to occur on the same day as Privacy Shield came in. So it was very opportune. Nothing particularly has happened today to coincide with your visit. Not yet. <laughs> what time is it? Of course, uh, yeah, it's early in the US. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just introduce our, our speaker, uh, just to remind everybody as well that uh, please switch off your phones or put them on silent if you don't mind. Um, feel free to tweet at IIEA. Um, the opening comments will be on the record and the Q&A afterwards under Chatham House rules. So, Julie Brill joined Microsoft uh, to lead privacy data protection and other regulatory issues as head of its privacy and regulatory affairs group and as Corporate Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Privacy and Regulatory Affairs. Mm -hmm. It's very long. I know, very long. <laughs> Exhausting. I have two cards instead. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Brill is recognized in the United States and around the world as one of the foremost leaders on privacy data protection and cybersecurity law and policy. From 2010 to 2016, Ms. Brill was the Commissioner of the U.S. Federal Trade Commissioner, uh, Commission. Um, appointed by President Obama and unanimously agreed by the uh, Senate. Yep. I'm right? You yes. Are right. It's hard to get through the Senate these days. Yes. And later to co lead the Global Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group at Hogan Lovells, a leading global uh, law firm. Ms. Brill previously served as Senior Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Consumer Protection and Antitrust for the State of North Carolina and as Assistant Attorney General for Consumer <laughs> Protection and Antitrust for the State of Vermont. So, with that introduction, please welcome Thank Julie Brill. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here, and I was so honored when uh, the Institute invited me to come back. I think they saw me on the agenda for the summit um, yesterday, and um, I was so, so... No? No. Oh. Of course. Of course. Well, well, it, it, it's, it's, oh, of course, of course, and it's lovely, lovely to be back. And um, so thank you, Barry, for that lovely uh, introduction. Um, so uh, one of the things that I would like to focus on in my brief talk here is um, the evolution of privacy and the imperative of modernizing privacy protection to keep pace with changing expectations and norms in a world that is being transformed by rapid advances in digital technology. I'm gonna take you back to 1890 and the right to privacy, which was one of the most influential law review articles of all time, and also one of the most eloquent, if you have not yet read it. Written by the great American legal thinker and Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis and his friend and fellow lawyer Samuel Warren. They described the ongoing transformation of our understanding of rights in the face of human progress and the law's remarkable ability to adapt in response. Political, social, and economic changes entail the recognition of new rights, they wrote, and the common law in its e eternal youth grows to meet the demands of society. They, Brandeis and Warren, were moved to pen this essay because the new technologies of their time, instantaneous photographs and what they described as numerous mechanical devices, had invaded the sacred precincts, this is in their words, of private and domestic life and threatened to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. They believed it was time to define the right to privacy in a new way. Recent inventions and business models, they, ex they explained, call attention to the next step which must be taken for the protection of the person and for securing to the individual 
the right to be let alone. Now we find ourselves in a similarly pivotal time, a time of technologically driven change and disruption. Over the past few years, how people work, play, and learn about the world has changed dramatically. Industries have been reinvented, jobs redefined, how we create community and connect with one another has been transformed. Now, as then in 1890, recent inventions and business methods have shifted how people think about privacy. In our time, instead of photographs and, and mechanical devices, it's mobile devices, cloud computing, and more recently, artificial intelligence. Now, as then, it is time for the law to grow to meet the demands of society. Today, the issue is less the fear about what is whispered in the closet will be proclaimed from the housetops, although that is still a concern. In our digital world, people still want their doctors to have access to their health, and health information, but not their friends or colleagues. Businesses still need to share sensitive information with their partners, but not with their competitors. And families still want to share news about their loved ones with each other, but not with strangers. But because so much of who we are is expressed digitally, and so much of how we interact with each other and the world is captured and stored in digital form, our understanding of privacy has shifted. Instead of preserving the right to be let alone, I believe modern privacy law must embrace two fundamental realities of life in this digital age. The first is that people expect to be able to use digital tools and technologies to engage freely and safely with each other and the world. The second is that they want to be empowered to control how their personal information is used. Now, whether we protect these two things is one of the critical challenges of our time. How we address this challenge will have profound consequences. This challenge has grown only more complex and more urgent with recent advances in artificial intelligence that have greatly accelerated this pace of change. Already, almost without us noticing, AI solutions have become essential to our day-to-day -day lives. The power, the app, the, they power the apps that we use that show us the fastest way to get from place to place. They enable, that is AI technologies, enable video and music streaming services to predict what we might want to watch or listen to. And they, they the AI technologies, help spam filters detect junk email and credit card companies prevent fraud. This is clearly just the beginning of the impact that AI can have on our lives. Artificial intelligence, especially for those of you who were at the event yesterday and saw my talk, you will know that um, I believe and Microsoft believes that artificial intelligence has the potential to improve productivity, to drive economic opportunity, to keep our families, homes, and communities secure, and to help us find new ways to address some of the most pressing challenges we face in healthcare, sustainability, ensuring that the disabled have an, the ability to um, interact in society as full um, citizens, to deal with climate change, poverty, and so much more. Of course, AI is built on data, vast amounts of data. Much of that data comes from people. If we are to realize the promise of artificial intelligence, people need to trust that their personal information is safe and that the companies and governments that collect and analyze it do so in a way that is responsible and respectful. But as we learned the hard way, uh, in, in, that as the technology industry in particular has learned the hard way, trust is fragile. Until very recently, Silicon Valley, that, those two words, were synonymous 
with a generation of brilliant innovators who are unlocking digital technology to make our lives more convenient and more fun. Then came revelations of foreign cyber interference in democratic elections, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and the spectacle of tech executives being called before the US Senate to be grilled on their practices and their ethics. Now, people are uneasy about the accumulation of wealth by the world's biggest technology companies and suspicious of their ethics. People fear that their privacy and safety in a world of intrusive surveillance and rampant cybercrime. And they are concerned that technology is undermining democracy. What we need today is a new generation of privacy policies that foster trust by reflecting a modern conception of the right to privacy, a conception that embraces engagement and control without sacrificing interoperability or stifling innovation. Now at Microsoft, our view is that the current US framework that governs access and use of data needs to be modernized. It needs to be modernized to promote interoperability with global data protection standards. And it needs to recognize that our new conception of user empowerment is an essential part of the fundamental right to privacy. This is why we were the first company to extend data subject rights that are at the heart of the general data protection regulation. And we, and we did so with respect to our customers all around the world. And these rights include the right to know what is, uh, data is being collected about you, to be able to correct that data, to delete it, or to take it someplace else. So we have extended those rights to all of our commercial customers around the globe. What is striking to me is how clear it is that the desire to maintain control over personal data is universal. So as part of our commitment to give these data subject rights to our um, consumers around the globe, we offer a privacy dashboard where people can manage their privacy settings, they can see what data that we have about them, and they can clear that data, that is delete that data if they want to. Since GDPR went into effect, millions of people have used our dashboard to exercise their data subject rights. And these are people that are not just from Europe. Our data shows that on an absolute basis as well as a per capita basis, people in the United States are the most actively engaged in controlling their data. Information about our, from our privacy dashboard also makes clear that people in Japan, Brazil, China, and Mexico are highly engaged with controlling their data as well. Meanwhile, Governments around the world are recognizing that control is something that their citizens want and need. Today, we're seeing a global movement to adopt frameworks that enhance consumer control mechanisms modeled on those that are required by GDPR. New privacy laws have passed or are being developed in Brazil, in Japan, in India, and all of these laws are designed to empower data subjects through GDPR-inspired provisions. Even in the United States, California lawmakers have recognized this new privacy paradigm and have enacted the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, which is scheduled to go into effect in about 18 months. It also includes provisions that give consumers more control over their data in ways that are inspired by GDPR. All of this should serve as a wake-up call for US companies and for the US federal government. We in the United States can't sit back and ignore the moment that we are in and the paradigm shift that is occurring. Now, as I said a moment ago, our goal, is, uh, our goal must be to move toward privacy legislation that fosters trust and global interoperability without stifling in innovation so that we can continue to explore how to harness the potential of technology, including artificial intelligence, to improve people's lives. 
We all recognize the import importance of AI, and we are all racing to understand how we can use AI to improve productivity and to drive economic growth. This past spring, the European Commission called for public and private investment of 20 billion euros by, by the year 2020 to expand AI research and development capacity and speed implementation of AI technologies. Meanwhile, from France's 1.5 billion euro AI for Humanity initiative to the UK's new industrial strategy to Germany's upcoming AI master plan, countries across Europe are exploring how they can capture the economic opportunities that will come from creating a strong AI-based technology industry. Ireland, which is already a hub for some of the EU's most talented AI researchers, clearly recognizes the importance of the economic opportunities that AI promises. Earlier this year, your government announced plans to invest 500 million euro in disruptive innovative technologies, including artificial intelligence and robotics, as part of its Project Ireland 2040 initiative. Some US policymakers and business leaders are concerned that the reach and complexity of the European approach to privacy, as reflected in GDPR, may hinder innovation in general and AI in particular. I believe that assessment is not entirely fair. There are approaches in GDPR that align with the modern AI first world, including the focus on accountability through ongoing risk assessment documentation, the granting of some benefits under the law for pseudonymized data, and data processing that can be conducted on a lawful basis other than consent by balancing the rights and freedoms of data subjects against the interests in processing the data. These requirements provide, in my view, a good foundation for moving forward in an AI-first world. Yet it's important to be aware that the GDPR may present some competition concerns. Appropriate implementation of the provisions that are within GDPR, including the ones that I just mentioned, is expensive and requires a lot of attention and work, a fact that may well give large, well-funded com well -funded companies a distinct advantage over startups and small and medium companies in the race to create innovative AI-based products and services. In addition, some of the core concepts of GDPR reflect the fact that the basic framework was created nearly seven years ago when drafting the law got underway. And so they do not reflect the current state of te technical understanding and could unnecessarily limit responsible innovation. For example, while GDPR's principle of data minimization need not be antithetical to AI technologies, it is uncertain how researchers, researchers and companies can live up to this principle in the eyes of European regulators, given the vast amount of data consumption needed to ensure that AI solutions are accurate and effective. In addition, our researchers at Microsoft have demonstrated that processing more data about disadvantaged groups may be needed to ensure that AI systems are fair and unbiased. Currently, there is uncertainty over whether companies can satisfy the data minimization principle even if they proactively articulate and document these purposes and demonstrate that this vast amount of data is relevant and appropriate. Now another way that GDPR may reflect an outdated understanding of technology is, is in its provisions relating to de-identification. Under GDPR, for data to, to be considered de-identified and therefore more widely usable in AI, in AI generally, the process of de-identification de must be essentially irreversible. Data scientists have created robust de-identification techniques, techniques that come close to this ideal with 
everything from differential privacy to encryption to federated learning. All of these technologies and techniques showing real promise towards robust de-identification. But many data scientists believe that irreversible de-identification is not yet achievable. Over the next few years, how these and other provisions of GDPR are interpreted and how GDPR's requirements are reflected in the laws of other countries that are seeking to mirror GDPR will play a critical role in how the artificial intelligence revolution unfolds and who benefits. Now, how the US and the EU respond to each other's efforts to address these critical challenges will affect our ability to maintain interoperable systems that form the basis of the free flow of information and global economic prosperity. We live in a world in which the free flow of ideals and ideas and people and data is the foundation for prosperity around the globe. Our economies and cultures are tightly linked and mutually interdependent. Ensuring that data can continue to flow across our international borders is critical to maintaining economic stability, as well as to maintaining our open and free societies. The upcoming discussions about Privacy Shield, as well as the perennial discussions about the adequacy of US data protection laws, are all important conversations, and all of those conversations should continue. But I believe these conversations are fundamentally hampered by misconceptions on both sides of the Atlantic about each other's laws. In the US, there is a belief that Europe will become an AI desert because GDPR will stifle innovation here. Now, as I just discussed, while there are legitimate concerns about some provisions of GDPR and how they will be interpreted and whether or not they will hinder technological development, I think the overarching concern about GDPR is in the United States, I believe that concern is overstated. In the EU, in, on the other side of the Atlantic, there is a belief that the US does not have robust privacy laws. Now, as I just said, I agree that the US does need to enact baseline privacy legislation that will enable users to control their data and implement much stronger accountability and transparency mechanisms for all data, not just sensitive data like health and financial or data about children. But taking a step back, clearly the US did get some things right. If you look closely at GDPR, you'll find a number of concepts and provisions that were clearly inspired by US law. These include the requirement for parental consent to protect the privacy of children, the requirement for breach notification, and the concept that processing should be consistent with the context of the transaction. What we all seem to forget too easily is how closely aligned we are when it comes to privacy, both as a matter of law and as a question of underlying values. Here in Europe and across the Atlantic in the United States, privacy laws are based significantly on guidelines that were adopted by the OECD in 1980. In, and that was in response to the then increasing amount of personal data that was being transferred across national borders. Those guidelines, the 1980 OECD guidelines, were in turn based on fair information practices that were developed by the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in its 1973 report, which was entitled Records, Computers, and the Rights of Citizens, Report of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Automated Personal Data Systems. And the 1980 OEC requirements, in turn, influenced both the European Union's 1995 Data Protection Directive and influenced guidance and frameworks that were deployed by the US Federal Trade Commission, my old agency, for decades. Now, at Microsoft, we believe that the baton has been handed to the United States from the European Union in this ongoing transatlantic dialogue about privacy. 
We believe the next step is for US law to take inspiration from EU law and ensure that the fundamental right to privacy is honored by providing data subjects with control over their data and requiring greater accountability and transparency in how companies use data. And together, we should continue, that is, we in the United States and you here in Europe, should continue to examine whether GDPR and the laws that it inspires around the world can be improved to ensure that innovation will flourish. Now, I'm confident that we can achieve these goals because beneath whatever facts and perceptions there are that divide us lies the much more important truth that our values are closely aligned. On both sides of the Atlantic, we believe deeply in the importance of free speech, in, a, in an open internet, and in free data flows, all with the goal of promoting freedom of expression and equal justice under the law, and strengthening global connectedness and promoting global prosperity. These values are at the heart of our democratic societies. The urgency to preserve and protect them has been reinforced by our histories, including the fight against fascism and totalitarianism here in Europe, and the exposure and experience in the United States with McCarthyism and the domestic surveillance of Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders. The truth is that on both sides of the Atlantic, we place the highest priority on protecting privacy as a fundamental right that is the foundation for all the freedoms that we treasure. And we both place a high priority on fostering innovation as the foundation for prosperity and economic opportunity. We have inspired and influenced each other in how we promote and protect these priorities. I believe it is essential that we continue this transatlantic conversation that, have made, that has made all of this possible. They, they, these conversations, are vital if we are to maintain the free flow of data that drives economic stability, enables technological progress, and ultimately serves as a foundation and bulwark for peace and prosperity. Thank you very much.